fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your host, Eric Shapiro. David North Martino. John Copenhaver. And Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Riverside and one hundred five oh AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Joe Goldberg is here, so it's going to be an exciting day. Thriller. It's a thrilling day. I'm in the house. You're in the house, so it's always thrilling when. <laughs> Yeah, Joe is in the house. You can't even get it out. Yeah, your tongue flipped off its rollers. Well, you I just about fell asleep when you yeah, said uh, Joe is in the house. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> I thought you were my kids for a second. Oh well, yeah, well, that's you know that's what I'm here for. Hey, you are you are in the in the editing process of your new books. So that'll be exciting. Yes, in fact, I just sent it to the Central Intelligence Agency for pre-publications review. So a little bit late. Well, I mean. They won't They'll read find it anyway. something. Yeah, you know. it's true. <laughs> like like to hear from them. It used to be easy. Now it's a little bit more difficult. But yeah. hopefully, it will make it through without too many redactions. Well, it's just you can't. You got to stop using names. You know. Yeah, and and crypts and things like that. Yeah, I just want to one one so I can say the stuff that the CIA didn't want you to read, and then I can use that as yeah. marketing. And then you disappear. Yeah, exactly. You know, I leave it in anyway. Coming. Nothing in. but your squirrel and tomatoes left. Oh, that's right. It's that time of year. I vote for the squirrel. It's true. Yeah. They're smarter. He's, he's tougher. Now, Mr. Uh, Gavin Stone is here as well because he's going to help us because our guest is a little bit rough. He's, you know, kind of a savage. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm lucky I don't have to go through pre-publication review or some people mistakenly say approval. Who would say something is dreadful? Oh, no, nay, nay. Don't say approval. <laughs> they don't like that. Well, you've got the name of an agent. I mean, if I was going to write a book about a thriller and a spy agent, his name would be Gavin Stone. <laughs> it's a good one. It's yeah. Like Helm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to argue with that. Yeah. It sounds like a really smart, tough, good-looking guy with all these chicks around him. It's just like James Bond. Gavin Stone, 008. <laughs> just, his real name is Louis Lipschitz. But he yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no, but, it, you know. It might not be real, but it certainly sounds like That's it. it. Exactly. I can um, I, I can just just give that image and, and go with it, run with it. Why not? Yeah. Instead, it's short little guy with a stum- stomach <laughs> eating eating a lot of chicken. Yeah. Don't go down the chicken. <laughs> uh, don't get the double O seven. Just the double O. Yeah. Double O. Double O. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, X, 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 double X. <laughs> well, speaking of X's, now this is a, a friend of yours, isn't it? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Gavin? Yeah, good friend, John. And, you guys. and uh, not only a good friend, but also the man who's responsible for looking at every bit of work I do and saying, yeah, that's definitely not good enough, and sending it back to me and saying, try, and again. try again. So that's why you'll never get anything else. <laughs> He's helped me so far so much. Yeah. He's the yeah. blame. He's helping the public, keeping you away. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mr. Jonas Saul, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. What, did we wake you up? Or? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I've been holding back, uh, suppressing uh, laughter. Oh, suppression's not good. No, okay. How did you get into this? I mean, because it says in your bio that you've been selling millions of books, and you've been just doing crazy stuff here. So how did, how did you get in this business, and, and did you realize you were going to be a success at writing? Um, I got into it. I, I, I started writing in my teens and 20s, and I, and I was in retail business, and I always wanted to be a you know, best-selling author. I idolized Stephen King and, and Dean Koontz in the 1980s when I was – in my teens and reading all of their books and thinking to myself, man, wouldn't it be wonderful to, you know, fill their shoes one day, do something like they're doing. So I just wrote and I wasn't, I, I'd say actually, to be honest, I wasn't really serious about it. I was just writing. So it wasn't until I got to my thirties when I got more serious about it. I 
had five novels written and about 50 short stories at the time. And so that's how I got into this. I thought, okay, yeah, let's get, let's get going. Let's do something here with this. So I started querying uh, agents. It was actually the summer of 2000. And, um, I spent 10 years uh, writing and looking for agents, um, going to writers' conferences, um, meeting them, pitching them, and I couldn't find an agent. Uh, I had a uh, lot of rejection letters, and um, I had people tell me that uh, you know, people nobody would want to read what I write. So um, I, I, I got a lot of discouraging. Uh, I, I actually, I actually lost, a lot of, lost a lot of faith in the business back in 2008, 9, and 10 after a decade uh, of searching. And um, I'd heard about this, uh, the Kindle, and I heard about self-publishing. And I, yeah. Anyway, I decided to try that. Um, so it was February of 2011. I uploaded um, to Amazon four or five of my novels. I can't remember exactly. I think I uploaded like two or three right away, and then I added a couple more. And they started to sell. Um, within four months, I was making a living wage. And within eight months, I was making more money than I've ever made before. And my books were racing. They were hitting the charts. And um, so I worked full-time as a writer. That's how I got into it. I self-published. I started on my own. Um, I had no, no, no one had any faith. I'm the only one who believed in my work. And I think that's really, I think the, the takeaway here, if there's an author listening, or even a young uh, entrepreneur looking to open their business, you have to believe in you. And uh, even though no one else believed in me, and I had actual le rejection letters saying nobody would want to, you know, read about a, um, a vigilante female like Sarah Roberts, this, this won't fly. Um, and yet that's the one that sold millions of books and has a Hollywood deal with Mad River Pictures now. Uh, season one, I'm hoping after this strike, we'll start filming. So, I mean, I've sold it to L.A., I've sold it to publishers, and I've sold millions of books. And I, I do have an agent now. Um, I signed with my current agent in 2016. I, I'm still signed with the same agent. She's wonderful. Um, so that's how I got into it. Um, did I ever think that I would be at this place? There's an answer, and then there's a cocky answer. Um, let, let me give you the cocky one for a bit of spice. Um, the reason I say that is because I believed. I think of a vision board. I believed I'd be here. I didn't have any doubt. And the reason I say that, and again, I'm not being cocky. The reason I said that is because I learned years ago that doubt is your traitor. Doubt is the thing. It's, it's, you know, when you, they say I was beside myself, it's almost like you create another version of you when you have doubt. And that person is whispering in your ear, you're not good enough. You won't make it. You can't do this. I kicked doubt out of the way. And said, no more. I, I, you know, I won't stop me. So I gave doubt a funeral and I said, bye bye. You're dead. I believe I'm good. I believe I'll make it. I'm going to keep writing until I'm, I'm, I'm really good at this. I'll figure it out. I'll study English. I'll, I'll make sure I know how to, I'll be so good that I can edit books. I'm just going to keep going. Nothing can stop me now. And that's what I did. And then the book started to sell. And so did I believe I'd be there? I had to. Because no one else did. How, how, do, how do you keep that faith, so to speak? So here you are going to shows and you're, you're hitting up agents and you're sending out manuscripts and then you're getting people, you know, they're turning around going, no, ooh, and sending you back letters. And here you are working retail, so you're, you're working the McDonald's drive through <laughs> and, uh, and, and they're telling you no, but how do you, so how do you, how do you know that you're not maybe bad? Like, because we all have doubt. And I say this because all of us have written. And, and at the end of the day, even when you write and get published, it, there's still that little bit of, oh, is it okay? You know? I, I agree with everything you've said. I do believe that there's a little bit of this and that. And, um, I, I, all I did was take the constructive criticism. Anytime someone said something that made sense to me, I look, re looked at what I was doing or, you know, my position or my writing or my style or whatever, my voice. I re looked at things and tried to modify them. But at the same time, every time someone gave me a rejection, I just reminded myself that that was their opinion. They didn't think it would sell. I believed it would. So I just thanked them for their time and was professional and moved on. I don't know you how. You killed them off in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how I, I mean, I can't really define a certain moment but i've always believed that i would have attained these sales I always thought i would 
and then I did. I always thought I would end up in L.A. I was pitching studios in 2014 and 15 without an agent. I, I, I had an offer on the table from Sony Pictures, and I still didn't have an agent. It wasn't until I went to a writer's party on Sunset Boulevard um, one Friday night. I met a bunch of writers and passed out my card, and we were talking, that an agent, agents were calling me the next morning, and I signed with one. Ended up getting me a much bigger deal, so I had to pass in the Sony Pictures deal. I'm just, these are events that were somewhat like milestones that I always felt were coming. No matter how many times I got I 10 years of rejections, I, I just believed I would, I would do something. It would happen for me. I had to, I had to. No one else did. And I think that everyone out there has to. And you just got to keep going. Here, here's the other thing. One, one quick thing. I write a lot and I write often. The best way to promote yourself is to write another book. I've always believed that promotion, advertising, all the best way to promote yourself is to write another book. You've got to keep having something coming out. So I write a lot. I have, I've written over 55 novels now. I believe that you have to keep writing. And so people that have written one or two books and they're struggling and they're, geez, you know, I, I've got these books out and the sales aren't there. You have to write another one. You have to write another one. You have to get to 10 books, I believe. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Then you start getting noticed on also bots. You get noticed on different pages on Amazon. You get noticed, you find, you know, you, you, you get it into Ingram Spark. You get them into different places. And now libraries or bookstores are buying and you start to get noticed. And then you keep writing. Then you get to 20 books. You get to 25. Okay, now you're going to do something. So you're going to get somewhere. I've always believed that too. And it was on book 13 or 14 when I, when I started getting interest in Hollywood. I wouldn't have had interest if I was still on book three trying to do Facebook ads. So I just believed that not only did I have to put myself out there, and, but I believed that if I did, there would be some kind of success. And it turned out that the Sarah Roberts series were, are my best-selling books. Right. And sleeping with people at the Sunset Party was helpful. Oh, absolutely. What? <laughs> Bad connection. <laughs> so what was, it, what was it, Jonas, that they saw in you after all that time? What, what, what happened? What clicked? Was it your character? Was it the story? Was it you? What made the difference? It was the sales, the numbers. That was what they saw, the, the, the million sold. Because when you see that, that then you, 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 don't, you don't have to. I mean, a lot of people complain about gatekeepers. There, there are no gatekeepers when you sell millions of books now. You're going to get deals. Um, so you, you remove the gatekeepers at that point. The professionals who thought it wouldn't work couldn't say anything at that point when it was working. Now, if you're talking about what did they see and they as in the readers, well, they, I, just, I just was lucky enough to have people read the books and, and have word of mouth. I believe, I, and there, there's a certain bunch of things I do with my books that make them saleable. I, there's certain things I do that I've always believed books need, and that's, that's a longer story, but I, I believe in shorter chapters. I believe there's so many things I do to set up. I believe white space on the page meaning lots of hit, hit the enter key a lot. People feel like they're achieving something. They, they get to, it, it's one in the morning, they got to get up and work in the morning, and they're like, oh my goodness, he ended that chapter on a major cliffhanger. And then, okay, how big is the next chapter? Oh, it's a page and a half or two pages. Okay, I'll do that. So they read that. Oh, another cliffhanger. How big is the next chapter? Oh, it's only two pages and a half. Okay, I'll read that, and then I'm going to sleep. Before you know it, it's two in the morning, they're still reading. When you do that to someone, then they finish the book, and they can't wait to tell their friend, their neighbor, their, their book club, their, their whatever, their, their group. And word of mouth spreads. And this is what I believe really helped my uh, sales. And there's another patch, batch of things I used to do. I still do that uh, help. But you've got to do these things when you're writing. You've got to think about the psychology of the reader. I believe that since day one. It's Sarah Roberts, mm -hmm. that character, uh, very important. How did you create that character where where does she come from she comes from my brother my brother passed away when i was 14 and i i found that quite challenging to deal with and uh he was 20 and so uh for many years at 15 and 16 and 17 i was going through the grieving process as a, as a teenager well um and so anyway um i had i call it i don't know visions or whatever in dreams he came to me in dreams and he told me things. And I'd wake up and like, oh, my goodness, I had a visit from my brother. So it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I realized I've got to write this, but I'm going to do it from 
the woman's perspective, I want a female lead character. So I have Sarah and her dead sister, Vivian, and her dead sister talks to her and tells her things about the future or tells her, you know, a, a kidnapping is going to take place and it, and it can't, you know, this cannot happen. So she, she gives her a little heads up on the girl or where they're going to try and do the uh, attempted abduction. And so Sarah tries to avert the kidnapping. So Sarah's a vigilante and she works with her, her sister who speaks to her about it. So the idea came from the passing of my brother and then things he said and did in certain dream state I had, I guess. I mean, it only happened a couple of times, but it was very moving for me. And it, and it came to me that, yeah, I need to write something like this. But what are the challenges there when you're writing a female character from yourself and getting into the headspace? And, and how, like, what's your experience when you write this character? Do you see her, feel her, hear her? How, how does that work for you? Uh, you know what? That's a, that's a great question. I've, I hadn't really thought about it years ago when I began writing female lead. Um, I, I, I've written 55 novels, and of the 55, like 40 or 45 of them have been female leads. I rarely do male leads. With Sarah, it's so easy for me because I've been, I've been writing Sarah for 25 years. Sarah's, she's so real to me now. Um, and her, and her entourage, the, the people that are in the story, stories in the books that are with her, her, her friends, her family. Um, and they, you know, I often talk about how if, if there's a scene where somebody pulls a gun on them or something, every single character has a different response. And so I'm already in the head of each character uh, before I type chapter one. I already know how they're going to respond, what they're going to do, because I've been writing them so long. Going back to the very first book, how did I get into that headspace? I, I really don't recall, but I really did try to focus in the beginning, that I am writing a female and I need to write from her perspective. I think I found that quite challenging the first few books. I say I think so because it's, it, the first book went through, my goodness, it went through so many edits. I hired a professional editor uh, out of New York and we went through it three times, four times to get it right and over several years. And, you know, and then I went through more editing. And finally, I self published it in 2011. And when it was picked up by a publisher five years later, they went through an editing process. So this book, this book has gone through a lot. The final product that's on it, uh, that's available now, uh, is very clean and I believe it's highly professional and, and I'm very proud of it. But, uh, I think the first few books did take me a little to, to get into it. And now you you've got book 34 of the Sarah Roberts thriller series, we'll call it. How do you keep a story like this fresh after 34 books. Yeah, you know, and there is a plan. I have a plan to go to book 50. Um, so how do you keep that fresh? That's, yes, I've got like, uh, I've got, I've got book 35 in the works and uh, I'm going to keep going until I hit 50. Um, it's, it has been a challenge. I started to burn out around book 20. I don't know if my, my readers will, will hear that and they'll, they'll be nodding because they know that at book 20, I actually took a year and a half, two year hiatus from writing Sarah. And, but when book 21 came out, I was ready to do another dozen or more. Um, so I haven't burned out since then, but, uh, and not burned out for writing, just burned out for writing the series because I, I was struggling to keep it fresh. But that is a challenge. And I, I all I, the, the biggest thing I do, the thing that I believe is really important is characters evolve. Characters grow from what they've gone through and they, and I treat them as real as I can. So, Let's, let's examine, you know, that Sarah actually has a miscarriage in one of the books. Um, she, she wants to have a family. She wants to have a regular life. She fights this call to duty that she's got. So, you know, for the, for several books after that, I studied a lot on certain things that women go through with miscarriages. And so I have her doing some of those things and, and, and she's emotionally distraught. You know, then she does have a child. And so now in the series, um, her daughter, Willow, she's got a daughter. And so there's, there's, there's evolution and her relationship is strained and, uh, because of what she's doing. So there's lots happening all the time. It's, it's really important that yes, we have a new villain every book. Yes, we have things to deal with and so on. And that's got to be creative and that's got to be different. There's got to be, you know, 34 different. You can't just keep having kidnappings. You can't just keep having like bank robberies or something or kidnap. Oh, yeah. Or, you know, it's, it's got to always be different, but at the same time, each instance has to affect the character. So I really believe that it's character evolution that keeps it smart. 
keeps it going. Yeah. Jonas, I know you've got like this great array of books that you have published. I've got to ask, how many unpublished pieces of work have you got kind of sitting in a, in a file somewhere on your laptop or wherever else? Is, uh, do, you, do, you keep, do you keep all the, the things that you don't publish, and is, is there a mass of them, or how do you, how do you get on with that? Oh, that's a fabulous. I've actually never been asked that, and you know what the answer is? I have nothing that's not unpublished. That's not, but yeah, every single book I've ever sat down to write, even if I struggled, there's there's one book in particular that I had unpublished for about ten years, but I went back and I I went back and rewrote it. I didn't like the rewrite. I kept it unpublished, but then I went back and finally gave it a major commitment of a rewrite and a new title and everything, and I brought it out again in four years ago. So at this point, I have nothing that is unpublished, not a single novel. Every single book I've ever written now is available. That is fantastic. I've got, well, I've got a file, which is just, the file name is Page Ones, and there's probably about, um, kind of, maybe about 50 or 60 of started manuscripts that I've got so far into. Sometimes it's only a single, single page, sometimes it's a few pages, and I've gone, nope, just not good enough. And, uh, yeah, so uh, that, that, that surprised me. That's brilliant. Um, although, uh, yeah, I, 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 I understand what you're talking about because I actually have a, I, a story idea file. So I've got five books. I'm always five book ideas ahead. So I've got, I've got, I've got five, six paragraphs, but it's more, I, I write blurbs. Okay, we're going to have this, we're going to have that happen. We're going to, oh, and this and that. Yeah, here's the twist. So I write the blurb, if you will. And, and, you know, an idea will come to me next month. I'll write, oh, my goodness, i got to write that. So I'll write the blurb again so I don't forget. Um, yeah, okay. But other than that, actual sitting and typing chapter one and then getting to a place where it's not published, I don't have that. How do you write bad guys? How do you, do, how do you tackle that? Well, with bad guys, I do it two ways. Um, one is I get in their head in some books, like, say, The Immortal Gene. And the Immortal Gene is a book that has nothing, that has nothing to do with the Sarah Roberts series. There's, there's two of that right now, Immortal Gene and Immortal Target. But the Immortal Gene, Jeffrey Harris, I got into his head. He's a, he's a major psychopath. And um, he's really dangerous, really crazy guy. So I did a lot of research for him. And I went right into his head as he's watching the people and what he's going to do to them um, during the gathering that he does. I, and how I handled that was just research. I really wanted to um, make him very dangerous. And so I wanted the reader to see what he sees, hear what he hears, feel what he feels. Then there's other bad guys where I keep them a mystery. And I never do a point of view from their head. I only ever show what they're doing, their actions, from the other characters who are filled with empathy and sympathy and their and they're having a very hard time dealing with the bad, with what the bad guy is doing. <laughs> so I keep the bad guy a mystery. Wow, I like, I like both those approaches. I really prefer to get into the head of the bad guy. I did it with um, one Sarah book, uh, a guy named Elmore Ackerman, um, back in book four of the Sarah Roberts series. I got into his head too, but I just felt that I'm a better writer when I don't get too deep into their head because I'm, I'm not a bad guy and I could never imagine doing anything my bad guys do. So write what you know. So I have to guess a lot and use a lot of psychology and a lot of reading, um, to a, re a lot of research to try and nail them. And I've often had reviews that tell me that I didn't really nail it right. And some readers and beta readers saying, well, I don't know. So I try to avoid getting into the head unless I'm really confident I can nail it down. Uh, George, I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you just kind of basically, and I, I don't like writing asking process questions. I'm studying here, but that you kind of just let it rip. The, the, the detail is not quite important. Sometimes there's no detail. Sometimes it's just letting it go. And is that how you write a lot of the time, none of the time? All the time. What is, what is that about? All the time. All the time. The I found this interesting. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Because it's not the way I write. Yeah, it, it, and everyone has their own process, and I believe that we all must follow our own process or we'll end up getting blocked. Now, my process is, um, I call it word vomit. I literally will sit at the computer and um, type. Um, in the past, I've done up to 10,000 words a day, but I, I try to keep it to a comfortable four or 5,000 words a day right now. And I generally try to write my first draft within a week and a half or two weeks. Um, and that's, that, but it's not all good words. It's not something that I just write and then I publish it. No, 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 no. It takes months and months and months of editing and beta readers and rereading and rewriting, so much rewriting. 
but back to the original comment, yes, I don't focus on details. I don't focus on, I'm, I don't edit when I write. I don't believe in that. I believe in, you writers should write, editors edit. So if you want to put on the writer hat, then write and just spew. Get it on the page. Get, I have this great scene. I'm going to fill it in as best as I can right now because I've got to get to the next scene. Then I type that one. Then I type that one. And I get to my five or 6,000 words, and I'm actually gasping. Like, I, I, I'm panting. I, it's so intense. It's so exciting. Uh, so that's how I, that's my process. So then the, the first draft is done. Now I can calm down. The book is done. Let's go back and rewrite, flesh this out. I go back and do a rewrite and add easy 10, 15,000 words to the manuscript because I haven't fleshed it out the first time. So this is something I do. And then I have to go back and make sure it's, it's right. It's cohesive. It, uh, the plot works. There's no holes in the plot. There's, I, 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 you know, but the first draft, how I, how I write it out. Yeah. I, I just, that's my process. I couldn't imagine taking a month to write a book. Again, my process. I couldn't imagine taking longer than a month to write a book. I, that's just my process. Uh, there was once, there was once where I wrote a book and it took me three and a half weeks and I felt like I was, it took so long, I, I was getting bored. And if I'm getting bored, the reader will get bored. So I had to, uh, I had to really work on that one and, and, and really work on fixing it when I, when I finished. But again, that's my process. There are other people that take a year to write a book. And no problem. That's their process. I just, it's, it's, it, I actually probably take a year to write my book. I just don't do the first draft that way. Mm. What do you do to, like, I remember you telling me you wanted to try and put emotion on every page. What would you, what would you find is your best methods for inserting that in, emotion on each page into the story? Walls. I call them walls. Putting a wall in front of the character. Every time a character wants something, the writer's job is to not give it to them. And as soon as you don't give it to them, um, like, like Kurt Vonnegut once said in his, uh, writer's rules, even if a, a char every character has to want something, even if it's a glass of water. So every character comes on the scene and they want something. They want an answer from their boyfriend. They want the phone to ring. They want the murderer to drop the knife. They, it doesn't matter. You have to want something. And I'm not going to give it to them. So now they're distraught. They're emotional. They're upset. They, the, and then they show it. Again, no telling, show it. So let's go to the one with the boyfriend. She wants an answer from him. So she asks, and he won't give it to her. He ignores her. So then she bumps the table with her thighs. So then there's action. Then there's violent, There's tension. Every page, there's something. As long as you have walls, there's going to be something. And you want to have pace. So you have to have things like this that keep things moving. There has to be movement from somewhere on every page. And if you have someone say... In a room, like I, in The Disappearance, in my recent book, I had Sarah stuck in a car after a car accident. She was stuck in a car for over 24 hours. She couldn't move, couldn't get out of the car. Uh, so I'm writing scenes with Sarah by herself in this car for dozens of pages. But on every page, there's emotion and there's action. And, you know, even dialogue is a form of motion. So as long as there's something happening, even if she talks to herself and her voice cracks, there's emotion, there's something happening. I just believe in that. I put emotion on every page so much sometimes that I get goosebumps when I'm writing. In some cases, like in my one series I wrote uh, called the Mafia Trilogy, there's so much emotion in that one that I had to actually stop. I was My eyes were welling up. I couldn't even see the keys anymore. I had to stop and take a break. There was a couple scenes that overwhelmed me emotionally. And when I came back to the keyboard, I started to try and write that scene again. And I had to take another break. There's so much pain and so much emotion in my characters. I believe that uh, this is this is what makes good fiction. Oh, definitely, it it, it comes through. You can kind of. I, I was actually told that whatever you're feeling when you're writing, the reader will feel it when they're reading. Yes, exactly. I believe that when you when you're writing these stories, when you come up with an idea to put your character through or characters through, is the idea purely entertainment? Or do you have some sort of a subtext or a meaning that you want a reader to perhaps take out of the book? It's, it's primarily entertainment, but I do have a subtext. It's more of a theme, and the theme is hope. There's only one book I ever wrote that I did not have the theme of hope, and uh, it's a book called The Woman in the Woods. The, it, I let you think there's hope most of the book, but at the end there's a twist that there is no hope. And I just, uh, 
it was a rare, it was a one-off for me and I really wanted to try that. So I, I did it. But anyway, the theme for me is hope. It's almost like, isn't there a quote? I think there's a quote that evil may win, but it will never conquer or something, something like that. It was, it was a religious quote about the devil may get this or that, but God will always win. And so I always thought that's the way my books need to be written. The bad guy will get the, 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 the weak one, the girl, the abduction, the, the whatever. Um, they're going to grab Sarah. They're going to hurt her. It's going to be in a situation where, you know, she can't get out of. I write myself into corners all the time and have to figure out how to get out of it. And, you know, it looks terrible. There's no way. The police think Sarah's murdered someone. They're looking to charge her with murder. She's going to spend 20 years in jail. It's really, really, really bad, really bad. And then the last chapter, something happens, this happens, that happens, and it's all fixed and everybody gets to go home. So I'm not saying that happens, that's formulaic every single book, but my point is uh, I try for entertainment, thrills, and I try for hope. Or you could have Sarah wake up and it was all a dream. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's never been done before, isn't it? A plot device that not many people enjoy. <laughs> Well, there you go. Now I know. Didn't no. that happen? In, didn't that happen in Jacob's Ladders uh, back in that, that movie with uh, Tim Robbins in the Vietnam movie? They were all smoking, and then they had the whole movie, and at the end, they were just high or something. I forget now the exact. And yeah, it's been done so many times. Yeah. So yeah. it's just, just don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, violence. Do you think about sensitivity when you write thrillers? No. Or, you know, and what people you don't none. You don't. You just write it how it happens. I read it. I don't pull any punches. I don't. I, I'm, I, I probably should apologize. I've gotten letters from readers, too, telling me that I'm the source of some of the violence in the world because I write such horrible, I write such violent scenes. And I try to, make, I try to be very inventive in my torture and violent scenes. I'm not, I don't write saw. I don't write gore. But I do write uh, uh, unique I try to be as unique as possible, and I try to write a lot of good violence. <laughs> That's a goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good day, honey. I want good violence. Way to go, honey. Yeah. Have some chicken. I think the worst. Yeah. I think the worst. <laughs> the worst violence I wrote was in the Mafia trilogy because they do a lot of torture in the Mafia and um, in the in the harder, the darker side of it. And anyway, um, I even put a warning in that book because uh, there's some really bad scenes in that book. Good. It sounds like good dinner reading to me. Yeah. Extra sauce on that. Each one of these books, you've done so many books now in a, a fairly good timing, like fairly fast timing compared to what a lot of people do. Do you, do you feel like each one of these experiences of a book changes you somewhat? I mean, just, yes, somewhat. I may not notice the change, but I do grow. I grow as a writer. I grow as a, as a human being. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think in the beginning, more so, I might have noticed that, but I don't notice it so much anymore. No, I can't really say that that, I mean, I, no, I, I don't grow, I just write them so quickly, and I get into them so deeply right away, and then, uh, you know, I'm doing the rewrites, and sending it to my agent, or I stop publishing it, because I still do both, um, and I'm already thinking of the next book. I think it all depends, though, too, because The Woman in the Woods, I wrote um, almost two years ago now. And I only put it out in April of this year past. Uh, sorry, April 2023. I, I, I was on. I was holding on to it for a year and a half um, for editing purposes and so on. But when it came out, uh, that book was um, that book was a very that one changed me. That one was a big. I think that uh, every once in a while I have a book that that does that to me. But the woman in the woods was really a challenge and uh, a lot of fun to write. What, what do you find it so challenging? Like, what was it about that book? Good question. Yeah. I, well, the thing is, I write from the seat of my pants. Like, I don't outline. So I don't know what's going to happen. So I've never outlined a book. Well, that's not true. I outlined a book once, but I found the process not for me. So I've never outlined since. And so I, um, I have a basic idea of what's going to happen, and I just start writing the characters, and I write what's going to happen, you know, as best as I can. And it, and it plays out on its own. Now, that being said, there's a, a force, a very dark, dangerous thing in the woman in the woods um some people have disappeared at a, at a compound and some the authorities go in to check what's going on and they disappear so the government brings in some military types to come and check and they disappear and they it's like a bermuda triangle on land and they can't figure it out so they block it all off and i, did, I didn't even know why they were disappearing that's what I, that's what i'm trying to say though i didn't even know why when i was writing it 
So finally, the story evolved. I'm 90,000 words in, and I still don't know what's causing it. And the story has played out all the way. I've got maybe two chapters left to write, and we're about to go down into this bunker thing to find out what's there. And I, I went to bed that night thinking, tomorrow I've got to write what's there, and I still don't know what it is yet. So I found that to be quite challenging. <laughs> but then I found out what it was uh, through osmosis. I have no idea how. It just came to me. And when it hit me, I was, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. And I couldn't wait to write it. So I finished it and was told by several people, including my agent, actually, give her some credit, uh, that I shouldn't write it that way because it has no hope. It's very dark. It's very dark, what was in there, and uh, quite dismal. And uh, I left it the way it was. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, of course. You're yeah, a writer. Yeah, well, I, I did, but... Uh, Again, I don't pull punches, so I had to. This is what I felt was needed, and so I did that. And uh, to this day, I, I get good reviews on it, but there are people that have... I had to write an afterword. I usually write afterwards, but I did write an afterword explaining explaining my decision for the ending and why I ended it that way. Um, and many people have left reviews saying, you know, love this, love that, love this, but couldn't, I, I can't handle the ending. But because of the afterword, I get it now. So I've actually had that. So, And that's what... You know, my agent was referring to a lot of people can't handle how I ended that. I can't even handle it, but I thought it was a great way to end it. I ended the book once. I didn't know. I, I didn't know how it ended, so I just left it to the next book. <laughs> I actually made a cliffhanger. I know it's a mistake, but I have to be like, who did it? I don't know. I to, so let's wait till the next book. I'll figure out between now and then. Yeah. But let me ask you a question. Yeah. And let me ask you a question on. You got all these books. You have a lot of books. You're a fast writer. And you've mentioned this before, but I just want to ask specifically, how much is your readers hanging over your shoulders? You have you know, millions sold. You have lots of followers, loyal fans. Are they there watching you, you know, vomit on your, as you're writing? Or is that just later on or they're never there? Um, you know what? It's in messages. It's in Messenger. It's on Facebook. It's social media where the book comes out and they're leaving comments within 12 hours of the book's release saying, Oh, that was great. I'm going to go to Amazon and leave a review. When's the next one? So, yeah, they're there, and they're asking. How about as you're writing, though? How about as you're writing? Are they sitting there over your shoulders or typing? How do you mean? Obviously, figuratively. But Just are you thinking about your reader, how they're going to react to this, the plausibility of it, any, anything in there? It's, it's very rare. There's a couple of times, yes, there's, there are a couple of times where I have written something into a scene and thought, oh, I wonder what the readers are going to, you know, they're used to, with standalones, not so much. But with uh, Sarah Roberts, they're used to a certain. There's and there's definitely exactly. They're, yeah, they're used to a certain thing, and there's definitely one thing I did about four Sarah Roberts books ago, maybe five. I, I don't know. It's I've written so many, um, or I had a major character killed. And if my readers are listening, they're going to be going nodding their head again. They're really upset with me for that. I don't have a single reader that's ever messaged me and said, "Yeah, that would that works." Um, but I had a major character be killed, and. Uh, Everybody in the book tried their best to save their life, but they couldn't. And so that was a tough one. I wanted to test the waters because I have something coming in five or seven books where another character's got to go. And I've already mentioned it. I'm hinting at it. And the readers are not. They're already guessing who it'll be, and they're already telling me, I better be careful. It better not be this person or that person. So I'm, I've got to be careful with that, yes. And so they are, they are with me as a silent passenger or, you know, not so silent. <laughs> but see, growing. Yeah. And you know what? I don't mind. I really, I, you know, this is their entertainment. It's what they're paying for, and they're enjoying it. I don't have to do things that are extremely dark or in, in Sarah's uh, series. I can keep it, uh, the theme the same all the way to book 50. I, 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 I'm enjoying it. They're enjoying it. But I do believe in pushing the envelope sometimes. Wow. It's not very Canadian of you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have sorry in the book a lot? <laughs> no, no, no. Sarah's actually an American, uh, although she's living in Toronto with her Canadian family and friends. So that does help because I'm, I know the Toronto streets very well. Yeah. I, so your characters, what happens to them? Like, do they, do they, when you finish a book, do they disappear? Do your characters stay with you ever, or do they just, when you're finished with them, they're done? Standalones, mostly they're done. I mean, they may stay with me for a few weeks as I think about them or as I rewrite. And, and, but when the book is fully done and all the edits done and I don't, I'm not doing any more rereads, yeah, I think the only time I think about them is when I'm checking sales or talking to the publisher. But with Sarah, they're always with me. 
because I've, you know, 34, I'm working on book 35, 25 years of Sarah, um, has been in my life. Um, it's, it's huge. I have readers saying, what would Sarah do? I have, I have emails, I, um, readers saying, I, I, one reader emailed me and said she had to go into cancer surgery and there was some kind of 50, 50 odds she'd come out. And she messaged me saying that she's, in, she's going in with Sarah and Sarah's going to beat up the cancer for her. And we're going to come out together. And the next day I got an email from her. Sarah and I did it. Like Sarah's real to these people as much as she's real to me. So I, I get that a lot. And I, I really love that. And one thing I do, I mentioned earlier about uh, word of mouth. One thing I do is I add readers' names to my books. Um, I really, I feel so grateful for all my readers. And so when I see a name popping up often, and often they'll even ask me, hey, I'd love to be in a book. And I already have the reader's name for book twenty, uh, book thirty-five. Um, book thirty-four had a reader's name, Renee. Um, I, I do these pe- these these people. They come into the books, and then you know they get to help Sarah do something for her. And I make it personal, like it, the character looks like them, and and if they own a business or they work at a certain place, it's in the book. And then they, you know, they're buying copies, they're buying hardcovers and, and print, and handing them out to their family, and and more word of mouth. So, but it's a way that I get to honor the reader too. So it's real to them as much as it's real to them because they're reading Sarah for so many years. It's real to them because they get to even be in the book now. Wow, that's a great idea. I actually really love that. That was fantastic. Do you, do you have yeah, any a couple of regrets uh, or, or anything you wish you'd have done differently since starting writing? That's also a good question. Uh, I think that um, the only regret is I haven't written enough. Now, I know that doesn't, that doesn't sound well, but let me explain that. Um, in 2016, 17, at the time, I was writing um, five, six books a year, and uh, I went through a difficult time in my life in 2017, 18, um, and early 19. Uh, I went through a divorce, and so it was challenging. And in, in that two-year span, I think, I wrote two books in two years, and I regret not focusing more on it, and that... Uh, that hurt my numbers too. That hurt my sales. People forgot about me. Um, they forget about if they don't see the author all the time, every, every two to three months, another book coming. So I regret that I didn't give my readers what they wanted. I kept getting emails. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. But I was, I, you know, understandably I was going through something, but I know I could have done more. Um, so I do have some regrets there. I wish I could have given them more of what they wanted. So I, I picked it back up in 2019. And by 2020, I was back to actually, I did like, eight books that year, 2020. Um, I'm still doing my five or six a year right now and everything's going smooth and great. So there was one regret. Yeah, I, I didn't, uh, I, I, it's, it's almost like you, um, you have a, I don't know, think you have a business or a convenience store and everybody's buying, I don't know, something silly like salt and vinegar chips and you just decide not to pick them up from your supplier anymore. And everyone's coming in, well, I only want that one. And you just, it's, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. And you finally think, okay, okay, I'll bring in salt and vinegar chips. And everyone's gone. They, they found other stores, though. And you're not getting the same business you used to get. So I just think that I, I made that mistake. I didn't, uh, I didn't keep my readers happy for over two years. Mm, and so I do regret that. Well, and a big regret. You should have had Gavin Stone and Joe Goldberg in the, in the book. Put them in book 35, <laughs> and they're fighting over her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. me up. Yeah. Put me in the meat shop, the wood chipper. Yeah, sure. And, uh, <laughs> oh, <we're really> <laughs> they're, it's, 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 she has to decide between the two. <laughs> what will, who will she choose? The chicken yeah. choker? No. Um, here we yeah, go. Anyway. <laughs> here we go. So, listen, how do people find you? Um, it, social media, websites, what is your preference for readers? Um, my preference really is Facebook. I mean, I don't know if that's getting old nowadays, but for me, I'm on Facebook every day. I'm, I'm posting. I'm using Messenger. Um, I love Facebook. I've got a Jonas Hall page or my personal page. Um, but I am, on, I, I am on Twitter. I just don't use it a lot. And I'm on Instagram. And, again, I, I do use it. But I use both of them sparingly. Um, but I am there. Uh, I, I do have a website, but I don't do much with it. Um, I really just stay in touch with all my readers on Facebook or through email. So, yeah, jo- Jonas Saul on Facebook is very easy to find. That's pretty well where you'd find me. Yeah, no TikTok. JonasSaul.com. Yes, I'm on TikTok. But, again, I, my TikToks are more about um, I'm in Greece, so I'm learning Greek. And I'm, my TikToks, a little bit, they're only a little bit about the writing and the, 
and the writing retreats that I do and, and different things. But I am on TikTok. I've got maybe close to 20,000 followers on TikTok now. Um, so I am doing TikToks, but I, again, I don't even do them every day. Um, so yes, I can be found all over. But uh, if you want to stay in touch or you want to see what's happening or stay up to date, well, then the best would be Facebook. And what what are the retreats you go to now? Do you do you host them or are you part of it? Like, what are they? Writer retreats? Oh, good question. Yeah, I, I host them. I'm a retreat coordinator. I, I I own a company called Imagine Greece Retreats. Imagine Greece Retreats. Uh, we do writing retreats and reading retreats, and we have. Um, Best-selling authors um, come as a guest, um, in addition to myself, as I'm hosting the retreats. And um, I have a writer's retreat next week. And so a lot of people are flying in. Actually, this is uh, Monday here. So a lot of people are flying in Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all this week. I'm meeting them at the airports. We're doing walking tours of Athens. And, and then on Sunday, we take the ferry to the island. It's a six-hour ferry ride to the island. The hotel's all booked and ready to go. And we'll spend the whole week uh, on a beach doing a writer's retreat. We'll spend two to three hours each morning uh, doing some, I would hesitate to say classes. They're very informal and more intimate. But uh, we discuss writing. Um, a lot of what we're talking about, emotion on every page, how to do that. Dialogue, how to do that, how to do it right, how to do it clean. Um, you know, dialogue tags. So we were talking speech tags and action tags, how to do them right. Limits. And so we go through a lot of that. And then we do little lessons, like not lessons, exercises. So let's, let's, you know, let's do this, let's do that this afternoon and then get some writing done. Um, and then chat, say publishing stories over dinner. So we spend a week together, a small group and uh, the reading retreats are fantastic. We have a few authors, um, that we're, we're in discussions with for the June reading retreat. And, uh, we can get up to a hundred, 150 people at a reading retreat. Um, and they all just bring their books and they spend a week on the Greek island reading and hanging out with a best selling author who does Q and A's. We do, uh, we do little speeches about the author does speeches on how they got into writing and they do book signings and we have gift bags and merch and all kinds of great stuff. So it's, it's, it's so much fun to do these retreats. Wow. And so how do they find out about that? Do you have a website for that? Yes. Imagine Greece retreats dot com. Imagine Greece retreats dot com. Anybody wants, if, if no one caught that, you know, just find me on Facebook and fire me a message or come to my wall. But imaginegreaseretreats.com, we have, uh, we've actually booked C.C. Humphreys, uh, big author out of, uh, uh, Western Canada. I was trying to think of the word Western. I was thinking Vancouver. Western Canada, C.C. Humphreys is coming to the next writer's retreat next September. And we are in talks with a couple of nice, very big authors for this June. I, I can't name them yet because we haven't got the commitment, but we do have a Zoom meeting this week to finalize the details for the June reader's retreat. And this author is huge who's coming to the reading retreat in june we're very excited if this author finally signs the dotted line um but i understand that is going to happen so we're i'm this will be one of the biggest authors we booked so i'm really excited about that well fantastic well we'll put all that up on our website as well so people can uh find it find it easily oh thank you much appreciated to have me it's such an honor to be here well fantastic okay our guest in case you don't know is the great Jonas Saul. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.